uh, we looked at uh, derivation of conservation of mass, momentum and energy, right. Today we are going to uh, see if we can solve the fluid flow and heat transfer using these equations with the required number of unknowns that we have, okay. So we have looked at conservation of mass, momentum and energy, right. So essentially how many equations we have? We have one equation for uh, mass, right. And uh, momentum equation is uh, how many? Three of them, right. We have one in each direction and then energy equation is? Is one equation. So essentially we have uh, five equations uh, at our disposal, okay. And how many unknowns we have? So how many unknowns do we have? We have, uh, what are the unknowns we have? Uh, for a compressible uh, fluid, right, general compressible fluid that we have derived, U, right. So essentially U, uh, you mean U bar, right, essentially U VW, so that is uh, three unknowns, right. And then uh, we have pressure is an unknown, right, pressure is an unknown. And then density, rho is an unknown. Then we have an equation for internal energy E, right. So little e is an unknown and then temperature T is also an unknown, right. Unless we have a special relation which relates uh, internal energy to the density, we do not know the relation between these two, right. So as a result, uh, E is an unknown and T is an unknown. So how many of, how many unknowns do we have in total? We have 3 uh, plus 4, right. We have a total of 7 unknowns, uh, whereas the number of equations we have are only, only 5, right. So can we solve for this uh, 7 unknowns with these equations? We cannot of course solve for this. So we need to invoke uh, further assumptions, right. So we need to uh, invoke something known as uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. We need to invoke something known as thermodynamic equilibrium, right. What does the thermodynamic equilibrium mean? It means that if you have a simple compressible system, right, assuming that that is in thermodynamic equilibrium, then we just need two independent intensive properties to completely specify the state of the system, okay. So essentially uh, from essentially the uh, state principle, uh, what we have is we need uh, two independent intensive properties uh, to completely specify the state of the system, right. If we have a simple compressible system, right, that means there are no other external forces acting on it. Uh, on this particular system, okay. So uh, we just need two independent intensive properties and all other properties can be obtained from these independent properties that we have specified, okay. So if we choose uh, as our properties as uh, let us say uh, density and temperature as our independent properties, okay, uh, then what we can do is we can go about and write uh, and relate the other properties. So for example, we choose let us say density and temperature as the uh, independent properties. Then the other two quantities that is uh, the other two thermodynamic variables that is pressure and internal energy. So pressure can be obtained as a function of density and temperature. Similarly, the internal energy E. Uh, uh, as a function of uh, density and temperature, right. So essentially we have now two more equations, right. So this is the uh, sixth equation and then we have the seventh equation, right. So we essentially we have seven equations and seven unknowns as we go here, right. So we have plus two here which gives us uh, seven equations and seven unknowns. So theoretically in principle we can solve for all the set of uh, variables, okay. So what does, what does the uh, so, what is the uh, principle that gives us these two? This is known as the equation of state, right. Essentially equation of state uh, for a particular, for a particular 
fluid relates uh, the pressure and internal energy to the density and temperature variations, right? So essentially equation of state gives us uh, these extra equations, okay, which I would probably write it as sometimes as EOS, okay, as a short form. Now if you have a, a perfect gas, then we know that uh, the pressure is related to the density and temperature using what? Ideal gas equation that is P equals rho RT and uh, the internal energy for a uh, fluid, right, for a perfect gas is given as Cv times temperature, right, so the absolute temperature. So we have these two equations which we use to relate uh, density and temperature to pressure and the internal energy, okay. All right, so that is good. Now uh, what we can see from here is that the equation of state uh, relates uh, the energy equation on one hand and the mass and the momentum equations on the other hand, okay. So essentially uh, equation of state is the kind of connecting link between these two, okay. So why do we say that? We say that because uh, the energy equation contains uh, internal energy, right, E, whereas the mass and momentum contain the density, pressure, uh, and of course the energy equation also contains the temperature, right. So we have these things. Now uh, the changes in density, the changes in density and the changes in pressure cause a changes in temperature, right. Now that is only possible if you have a compressible fluid or a compressible flow, right. Only uh, under if you have a compressible flow or a compressible fluid, you have density changes which are caused by changes in pressure as well as temperature, okay. So essentially what we mean is that, uh, okay, so the changes in density are caused by temperature as well as pressure if you have a compressible fluid or a compressible flow, okay. Now this is what relates uh, the energy equation kind of links the energy equation to the mass and momentum equation, okay. Now if you have a, an incompressible flow or a fluid for which uh, density is uh, constant, right. So if we have an incompressible fluid, then what happens? Then what happens is basically you do not have any density changes. As a result, your energy equation, right, the equation for temperature or internal energy gets decoupled from your mass and momentum equations, okay. So essentially this link is, will not be there between mass and momentum and energy. As a result, temperature, right, the changes in temperature are not brought about because of the changes in density or in pressure, right, if you have an incompressible fluid, okay. So that means uh, for incompressible fluid, the temperature or the energy equation Uh, gets decoupled from the mass and momentum equations, okay. So what is a consequence of that? The consequence of that is the energy equation can be solved as a separate passive scalar transport equation, okay. So this can be solved uh, separately because it is no more coupled to the mass and momentum, okay. Um, as a result, in many incompressible fluid flow problems, we could just get away by solving only the mass and momentum equations. If we have an isothermal flow, if uh, we are solving for, an an, an, for a non-isothermal flow, then we have to solve for temperature as well uh, as a separate scalar, okay, with the, with the different boundary conditions that it has, okay. So, so that's kind of the takeaway message. Now, uh, as far as the complexity of the uh, solution procedures is con concerned, if you have a compressible flow system, then you have a equal number of equations and unknowns, right? You have seven equations, seven unknowns, you can solve for them one by one, okay? Now, we'll see that if you have an incompressible fluid or incompressible flow, your continuity equation uh, becomes just del dot u bar equals zero, right? Uh, as a result, you do not have an equation for density, right. So density is again now constant. And uh, what we will see is that this will bring about uh, another significant change, uh, which is basically your, uh, you have three equations of the momentum, which is uh, 
rho du dt, uh, rho dv dt and so on, right. You have these three equations and you end up with no equation for pressure, okay. So as a result, the equation for pressure is only again another equation for uh, in terms of velocities, okay. So as a result, the solution procedures for incompressible flows are quite different from the solution procedures that you have to adopt for solving for a compressible flow, okay. So that is what we are going to see uh, in the rest of this course uh, when we come to the solution of uh, fluid flow equations uh, for incompressible flows, okay. Questions till now? Okay, so let us move on. Okay, then let us look at uh, <coughs> uh, Navier Stokes equations for a Newtonian fluid. Now, uh, one thing we did not, of course, consider was the shear stresses, right? We talked about tau ij, uh, but when I have listed down the unknowns, I have comfortably not listed down the tau ij's. Neither you told me that the tau ij is still an unknown, right? We all assume that tau ij's are unknown, right? Uh, that is kind of good, uh, but we know that these are still unknown at this point of time, right? The shear stresses that we have in the momentum equations are still unknowns. Nobody told us how to uh, evaluate these terms, right? These are still unknowns at this point of time okay, which we kind of assumed while deriving this uh, unknown and the equations balance that these are somehow known, okay. So we assume that these are known, uh, which is what we are going to now uh, discuss, how do we introduce or how do we model the shear stresses, okay. So the tau ij, the 9 terms that we have out of which the 6 are the independent ones for an isotropic fluid are the ones which needs to be uh, somehow kind of need a model, right, to specify them in terms of the other solution variables that we have, okay. So we need a model to specify these in terms of solution variables, okay. Now by introducing a model for this, we are going to derive the uh, most useful form of uh, momentum equations all right so a common commonly used model is to relate the shear stresses to <coughs> to the uh, to the deformation rates okay are the strain rates in a fluid. So that is what we are going to use uh, as a model which was proposed by Navier and Stokes in the 19th century and then that is what we are going to use and kind of substitute these back into the momentum equations and derive uh, the Navier Stokes equations, okay. So the local deformation rate is composed of what? It is composed of linear deformations, right, shear deformations as well as volumetric deformations, right. So the strain rate contains uh, the linear or the angular, right, deformations, deformation rates as well as volumetric deformation rate, okay. So this is a um, deformation rate, okay. So essentially if you take a, a fluid element, in general uh, you can model uh, the change of a fluid element at a time t naught to another time t naught plus delta t uh, by a series of uh, elementary superpositions, right. These superpositions would be, you would recall from a fluid mechanics course that will be composed of translation a pure a rigid body translation, a pure rigid body rotation, 
and uh, fluid deformation, okay. And this fluid deformation would be again uh, composed of two components, one is angular deformation, right, and the one is a volumetric deformation, okay. So essentially you have all these four, we are only looking at uh, only the later part which is the fluid deformation, okay, the angular and the volumetric deformations because the other two do not come into picture in modeling the shear stresses that we have for a fluid, okay. All right, so uh, the, we call, we call these as the strain rates or the strain rate tensor, okay, which has again uh, nine components out of which six are independent if we have an isotropic fluid, okay. So how do we represent these uh, deformation rates? We have three components of, we have three components of uh, linear elongation uh, strain rates. These are given as, we, so we use the symbol S sub i j, okay. So we have just like we have tau i j, we use this s sub i j to represent the strain rates, okay. So again i j go from x, y, z, uh, each of them. So the linear elongation strain rates would constitute s sub x, x equals uh, 2 times partial u, partial x, okay. This would be 2 times partial u, partial x. Uh, S y y would be equal to 2 times partial v, partial y, S z z equals 2 times partial w, partial z, okay. Would there be a 2 here? No 2, right? It's just, uh, uh, this is just, this is just uh, partial u, partial x, partial v, partial y, partial w, partial z, that is for the linear elongation strain rates. And when it comes to the, uh, the six components of uh, shear elongation rates, elongation strain rates, So these are the angular deformation rates, so that is S sub x y equals half of partial u partial y plus partial v partial x, okay. Now you see that how if you have uh, S sub x x, how do you get uh, partial u partial x, you have two of them summing up to one, okay. So there is no two in there as I wrote before. Similarly S y z would be equal to uh, half of partial v, partial z plus partial w, partial y, okay. Similarly, s, x, z would be equal to half of partial u, partial z plus partial w, partial x. Okay, now uh, this looks like we can write in a uh, convenient summation notation a very simple formula that would be nothing but s sub i j would be equal to what? Half of, right? partial u i by partial x j plus partial u j by partial x i, right. That is all where we plug in i equals i and j as x, y, z each of them and get these uh, uh, three components of the linear deformation rates and of course uh, I said six components of sh uh, shear elongation strain, shear rates, right. I am sorry, I think I wrote elongation here, there is no elongation, this is just uh, shear, shear strain rates right. So what about the other three? They are the same as this, right, because of the isotropy, fine. So we have all these uh, strain rates that we get and of course we have this additional uh, volumetric uh, deformation rate which is given by what? Which is the sum of partial u, partial x, partial v, partial y and partial w, partial z, right. So in a convenient form we can write this as del dot uh, 
u bar right which would be 0 for if you have an incompressible fluid or incompressible flow which is not 0 if you have a compressible fluid right ok. We are still talking about a general compressible fluid ok. All right. Now, uh, we have introduced this model. Now, we need to know uh, how do we relate the shear stresses that we got the viscous stresses to the the strain rates right. So, if we have if we consider a if we consider Newton's law of viscosity right uh, then the Newton's law of viscosity relates the viscous stresses that we have. to the uh, strain rates and then the strain rates are again we have these uh, uh, linear or angular strain rates and we also have the volumetric deformation rate right. So, essentially the, the Newton's law of viscosity relates uh, the viscous stresses we have to each of these uh, strain rates ok. As a result we end up with uh, two coefficients of viscosity ok. One relating to the uh, linear or angular strain rates ok that is known as uh, the first or the dynamic coefficient of viscosity which is denoted with the symbol mu ok. And the other one which is known as the second coefficient of viscosity which is usually denoted with the symbol lambda ok. Ok, now we are assuming a Newtonian fluid. What is a Newtonian fluid? The, the viscous stresses are proportional to the linearly proportional to the strain rates ok. So, essentially that is how we get these things. Uh, so, we have a Newtonian fluid, but the fluid is still compressible right. We are still considering a compressible fluid, but a Newtonian fluid would that be possible or should a Newtonian fluid be always incompressible need not be right. You can still have a compressible fluid and it could be still a Newtonian fluid ok. So, we are still looking at a compressible flow uh, with as a, as a, the fluid behaving as a Newtonian fluid ok. So, the viscous stresses are proportional to the uh, linear deformation rates and as well as the volumetric deformation rates ok. Now, if this is the case we can again list down the uh, stray uh, the viscous stresses that we have as uh, using Newton's law of viscosity as tau uh, sub x x as uh, mu times 2 partial u partial x ok. So, that is the uh, coefficient which is making the proportionality constant go away which is making the proportionality symbol go away. You have this uh, first coefficient of viscosity plus you have lambda times del dot u bar ok. So, that is your uh, shear stress right the normal stress we have this is the normal viscous stress ok. Similarly, we can write down write down tau y y as 2 mu partial v partial y plus lambda times del dot u bar ok. And uh, we also have tau z z as 2 mu partial w partial z plus lambda times del dot u bar. Uh, of course, we have the shear components right that is the tau x y equals uh, mu times partial u partial y plus partial v partial x right that is what we have. Uh, similarly, tau y z equals mu partial v partial z plus partial w partial y and of course, you can also write down what is tau x z ok similarly ok. Now, uh, of course, the volumetric uh, deformation rate only shows up in the normal stresses right because that is a linear part of the deformation rate ok. Uh, now, uh, not a whole uh, lot of stuff is known about this second coefficient of viscosity ok. So, second coefficient of viscosity is uh, usually taken to be from experiments usually taken to be minus two thirds uh, mu 
okay. This is a good approximation uh, for gases, okay, for flow of gases. Now, uh, of course, we know that if you have an incompressible flow, what will happen to del dot u bar? This goes to zero, so it does not matter what will be the second coefficient of viscosity anyway, okay. So, partially the success of uh, the originally proposed to minus two thirds mu is related to the uh, observations, right, that del dot u bar was even zero in most of the compressible flows that were there, okay. So, as a result, the proposed uh, lambda equals minus two thirds mu was a huge success for, for over a few decades, okay. Now, we kind of tend to realize that that is because of uh, this term going to zero even for compressible flows, okay. Nonetheless, uh, the effect of the uh, effect of the uh, the second coefficient of viscosity is small even in you know practical flows, okay. So, the effect of lambda is small as a result it is not going to make a whole lot of change or difference in the results even if you have a compressible flow. But anyway we are not worried about it because we are looking at simulation of incompressible fluid flows, okay. Now, can we also write down a simple expression in terms of the index notation for the shear stresses from whatever we have proposed here, right. We can write down one, what would that be? That would be tau ij equals 2 mu, okay, 2 mu sij, very good, okay. So, essentially what we have is 2 mu sij because sij is again half of partial ui partial xj plus partial uj partial xi plus now, how do I bring in this extra component in here, which is non-zero for normal, which is zero for the shear? I use a delta function, right? That is uh, Kronecker's delta. So, that will be what? Lambda, right, times delta ij times del dot u bar, right? Can I write this? Okay, where delta ij is the uh, Kronecker delta function. which is uh, equals 1 if i equals z, which is 0 if i naught equals z, right. So, we can write down this one. So, this is a simple formula that relates the shear stresses to the uh, strain rates that we have, okay. All right. Now, uh, we have brought in Newton's law of viscosity and related the shear stresses to the uh, strain rates. Now, what do we have to do? We have to plug back these shear stresses into the which equations? Into the momentum equations, right? And of course, into the energy equation as well, okay? So, we will plug these back into the momentum equation uh, and see if we can uh, get a nice equation that we can use to that we can use to further integrate, okay? So, what was our uh, x momentum equation? If you go back, our x momentum equation was rho d u d t, right, equals, what was there on the right hand side? We had a pressure term, right, that was minus partial p, partial x, okay. I will first write down the equation in terms of the shear stresses. So, minus partial p, partial x, then we had partial, partial x of tau sub x x, partial, partial y, tau y x plus partial, partial z, tau z x, is that all? We had a source term, right? We said plus S m x, which is a source for the momentum equation in the x direction. Okay, very good. Now, can we uh, plug in these uh, shear stresses that we have obtained here, okay, into the into this equations, okay, and see what happens. Okay, so how does these equations look? So, if I plug in these, you have minus partial p partial x plus partial partial x of how much was tau x x? This was 2 mu partial u partial x plus partial partial y. What was there for? Oh, and then we had this extra lambda del dot u as well, is not it? Okay, which I have missed out. So, uh, plus uh, lambda times del dot u bar, okay, plus uh, partial partial y of what do we had? mu times partial u. So, this was tau y x, this would be partial u, partial y plus partial v, partial x plus 
partial partial z times uh, mu times okay mu times tau z x. So, this would be partial w partial x and partial u partial z okay plus we have s m x okay. Okay, very good. I will write down the V momentum equation also for the sake of completeness. So, that would be rho d V d t. So, this is the uh, y momentum equation, okay. Rho d V d t equals uh, minus partial p partial y plus, uh, I will directly write in terms of the shear stresses, okay, in terms of the velocity gradients. That would be what? Partial partial x of, this would be tau x y, right. So, this would be mu times partial u partial y plus partial v partial x okay plus partial partial y of this would be tau y y right tau sub y y this would be 2 mu partial v partial y plus lambda times del dot u bar plus a partial partial z mu times this is tau z y right this is tau z y. So, it will be mu times partial u sorry this is pa partial v uh, partial z plus partial w partial y okay plus s m y okay. I would not write down the rho d w d t which you can uh, complete later okay. Uh, very good. Now, we have obtained all these uh, equations which are only in terms of velocities right. On the right hand side now we do not have this shear stress vector anymore. As a result, our unknown velocity and its gradients appear on the right hand side, which could be obtained uh, somehow, okay, if we know the velocity field at a particular uh, time. Now, we are going to do some kind of a rearrangement here, so that uh, these equations look somewhat nicer and uh, also clean and also they look in a more uh, nicer way for uh, to work with incompressible fluids, okay. So, for that we are going to work uh, kind of rearrange some of these terms. So, I would go back to the x momentum equation, okay. And uh, what we, what I would like to do is uh, I am going to split this 2 mu partial u partial x term into 2 terms, okay. So, mu dou u dou x plus mu dou u dou x, okay. And then I am going to collect one of that uh, partial u partial x term from here, from here. And then the other term I am going to take it is uh, this one, this is first term of the, this term which is mu times dou u dou y and then uh, I think there is some mistake in here, is it? No, okay. So, I would take the second term here, I have not written con consistently. So, this is dou u dou z, okay. So, I would take down, write down these three terms together and I will write down the remaining terms separately, okay. So, can you help me write this equation uh, by looking at this? So, this is basically um, rho d u d t equals minus partial p partial x plus. Uh, so, I am writing down partial partial x of mu dou u dou x, okay. And then uh, partial partial y of mu dou u dou y and partial partial z of mu dou u dou z, right. Those are the three, three terms we are kind of writing them together. So, that means uh, partial partial x of mu dou u dou x plus partial partial y of mu uh, dou u dou y plus partial partial z of mu times dou u dou z. Is that correct? Yeah. So, we have uh, partial partial x of mu dou u dou x, okay. Then partial partial y of mu dou u dou y and then partial partial z of mu dou u dou z, right. These three terms I have written down together. Then what do we have? We have uh, one more term remaining here, right, which is again mu dou u dou x operated by partial partial x. And then we have one term here, this is partial partial y of dou v dou x, then partial partial z of this guy, right. Uh, in all these terms, um, I would like to interchange the order of differentiation. For example, here instead of writing partial partial y of mu dou v dou x, uh, assuming that, uh, okay, I will come to that point. So, let me first write down uh, these things. So, what do, what is that remains here? So, plus, what is the first term? Uh, 
I would write down in, in some brackets here, okay, curly braces, partial partial x of mu dou u dou x is the first term, right, plus partial partial y of mu dou v dou x, right, plus partial partial z of mu times dou w dou x, is it, was it x, okay, x, uh, so that is what remains. Uh, plus I think we had this del dot u which is also remaining, isn't it, this guy, right. So that guy would be what, yeah, so that will be partial partial x of lambda times del dot u bar, right, that is the remaining term. Do we have any other terms left out? We have the source term of course, so that would be what, that would be plus uh, s m x, okay, I have written all of these into curly braces, okay. So is this correct? This is correct, very good. Now let us say if we have a, uh, so the entire thing in the curly braces, I am going to write it as denote it with a new source term called S m prime x, okay, um, fine. Now we will see that that S m prime x would be equal to S m x if we have an incompressible fluid, okay, that is what we are going to look at. So let us say if we have a uh, incompressible fluid or flow uh, plus we have a constant viscosity, okay. So that means our mu is also constant. If you have a, a constant viscosity as well as incompressible fluid, that means both my what properties are constant? Density is constant as well as mu is constant, okay. So if my mu is constant, uh, I can interchange the order of differentiation here, right. Instead of writing partial partial z mu partial w w x, right, partial w x, I can write it as partial partial x of mu dou w dou z, right, okay. I would do that rearrangement and then write this curly brace term as uh, partial partial x of, okay, mu dou u dou x, okay, uh, plus I would write this as mu dou v dou y, right, because the partial partial x is taken out plus mu dou w dou z, right. Can I write, uh, can I write these terms like this, right, these uh, terms underlined in red as can be rewritten like this by just interchanging the order of differentiation because viscosity is now constant, okay. Plus we have, of course, this extra term is also in here. So I would go back and uh, write this guy here, which is uh, plus I have lambda times del dot u bar, right, plus s m x is the term in the curly braces. Now we can uh, of course simplify this little bit better. This would be dou by dou x of mu times, what would the, what would be these three terms together? Del dot u, right, this is del dot u bar, which is actually 0. Uh, plus we have lambda times del dot u bar, right, plus s m x. So uh, as we just discussed, this term would be 0, right, so as this term, right, if we have incompressible flow or fluid with constant viscosity, okay. So these are 0, in which case your s m prime x is what? Is the same as s m x, okay. So so this is what you have to keep in mind. So we are throwing everything, all these extra uh, strain rate terms that we do not like into this curly braces, okay. We are throwing them into the source term, but uh, you have to keep in mind that that source term would be the same as, as a source term that is brought about by some body forces or any other forces, uh, but it would not be the just the same. It would have these extra terms in case you have a compressible fluid or if you have a non-constant viscosity, okay. In those things, your source term is not just coming out of the body forces, okay. Very good. Now this looks good. Um, of course, you can again use, if you look into some textbooks, they would use this lambda equals minus two-thirds mu, in which case you have one mu here and minus two-thirds mu, which would give you uh, one-thirds uh, mu and so on, okay. That is kind of a, some simplification, but nonetheless that will term, that term will go to zero, okay. So can we now rewrite this in a more compact way? Now, if you take a look at uh, these three terms, can we 
kind of gain some insight here. So, all these three terms are operating on only one component of velocity that is u, right. They are all operating on u and then there are two derivative operators, right. One is operating inside, one is operating outside, okay. Of course, we are saying that we are looking at a constant viscosity fluid. So, this mu can be kind of taken out or it can be left inside, okay. Now, what would, can we write this in a compact way? So, this uh, if you if you have dou u dou x dou u dou y dou u dou z that is nothing but a gradient of u right which will give you a vector right. So, essentially these three terms can be written as gradient of u okay which is a vector and then it has to be multiplied with mu right. Now, uh, eventually we have to get a scalar out of this and they have to sum together. Then if I take uh, again we have dou by dou x dou by dou y dou by dou z we have another gradient right. So, that would be should be another del, but that should operate as a dot product, it should operate as a divergence right. Divergence of mu times grad u kind of aptly uh, puts these three terms into one term right. So, this is del dot mu grad u ok. Now, we have made uh, tremendous simplifications. So, we are going to come down and then write this in a nice way which is rho d u d t equals minus partial p partial x plus del dot mu grad u ok plus I am writing the source term which is S m x prime, uh, but we know that this is same as S m x because we have incompressible flow with constant viscosity ok. Uh, so, even if I leave out the prime sometimes, so do not get confused it is same as S m x whatever is brought about by the body forces ok. So, this is for uh, incompressible fluid with constant viscosity. Now, the equation looks much nicer right. Uh, much more pleasing. So, we can probably work with this uh, than with the previous uh, gigantic expressions we had for the shear stresses ok. Now, if you tell me what would be an equation for rho dou v dou t what would that be? Minus partial p partial y right plus del dot mu times grad v plus s m y ok. Of course, you can uh, complete the rho d w d t equation yourself ok. Fine. Now, so these are, uh, these are what? These are the Navier-Stokes equations, right? Navier-Stokes equations which are uh, independently derived by these two sci scientists uh, by introducing this uh, model for the shear stresses ok. So, that is important. So, the distinction between momentum equations and the Navier-Stokes equations is clear right. Essentially, momentum equations have the shear stresses as the unknowns still whereas, the Navier-Stokes equations do not have the shear stresses as unknowns right. They have a model for it which works very well um, and those are the Navier-Stokes equations which we will use to solve for fluid flow equations uh, in the incompressible uh, fluid flow regime ok. All right. So, now of course, we still have if you go back to the equations, we have the energy equation which also contained uh, shear stresses tau x x tau y y all these things uh, which we are not going to do, but rather I am going to kind of summarize uh, the equation. So, if you look at the energy equation which you have to solve even if you have an incompressible fluid only that this will be solved separately, you do not have to kind of couple them. Uh, so, what was the energy equation? If you remember back rho times d little e d t right, what was this? This was some I think minus p times del dot u bar or something like that right. Initially, we had del dot p u bar, but then we subtracted off the kinetic energy term which gave us an equation for the internal energy rho d e d t equals minus p times del dot u bar plus del dot k grad t right ok. Plus we had some source term S e plus we have a lot of terms right. We have a lot of terms in terms of uh, shear strains right instead of viscous stresses right instead of viscous stresses tau i j we had a lot of terms about 9 or 10 9 terms and I would like to call this all these terms as phi ok. So, what I mean by phi is a is the dissipation term 
which contains the tau ij terms, right? We had these uh, u times tau xx, u times tau xy and so on, right? We had several terms. Now, what you have to do is you have to plug in uh, the tau ij viscous stresses in terms of the strain rates, right? To eventually get all these terms in terms of partial ui by partial xj and so on, okay? If you do that, what you would see is phi uh, would read as mu times 2 times partial u partial x square partial v partial y square partial w partial z square, okay. Plus you would see partial u by partial y partial v partial x square plus partial u partial z partial w partial x square plus you would see partial v partial uh, z plus partial w partial y square okay plus lambda times del dot u bar whole square okay. So, this is something you have to derive uh, or rather kind of check it, okay. So, check this by plugging in the viscous stresses in terms of strain rates and then club all these terms. So, this is the dissipation term uh, which appears on the right hand side of the energy equation, okay. Now, uh, what is the first thing you see you notice about the dissipation term? Of course, it is composed of the strain rates, okay. But what is the thing that is there that kind of catches your eye? Squares, viscosity, okay. Oh, we have the viscosity, we have the mu and del lambda that is there, but the terms are all squared now, right? So, what about the uh, values we have? So, these are there. So, essentially, what will this term be if you have a, if you have, let us say, incompressible flow or a fluid, this term is anyway 0, the second term is anyway 0, right? Now, what will happen to the, so this term on phi is always a positive quantity, right, because of the square. So, this is always a positive quantity. Now, uh, what is it actually doing? It is actually, what it is actually doing is you have the strain rates, which are the deformation rates, which describe the uh, deformation of the fluid particles or fluid as it flows through, right. And you are getting uh, the deformations, right, which is described by this phi, which is acting as a source term on the right hand side of the energy equation, right. So, this is basically dissipation because it is converting the, the mechanical energy, which is the partial u by partial xj, right, all these terms, that is the mechanical energy, right, of the fluid into thermal energy, right. It is creating the internal energy or temperature, right. Essentially, it is increasing the internal energy of the system. So, the dissipation term always tries to uh, increase the internal energy of the fluid by extracting the energy from the mechanical component of the fluid, okay. So, that is responsible for the change in internal energy uh, by converting the mechanical energy into the thermal energy, right, okay. So, that is the only link, okay, fine. So, now we have looked at uh, the complete set of navier stokes equations including the energy equation by introducing the model for the shear stresses, okay. Uh, so, what we are going to do next is we are going to list down all the equations, you know, one by one uh, and then see if we can kind of come up with a, a common equation that can represent all these equations, right. If you see there are uh, several of these terms are common between all these equations, right. You have an unsteady term, you have a, a convection term and then you have a divergence term and so on, right. So, we are going to kind of list down all these equations one by one and then see if we can find some commonalities between them and then thereafter go from there, okay. So, okay, thank you.